So as the G20 summit continues into its second day in Rio de Janeiro, world leaders have taken to the stage to address critical global issues. This marks a historic moment for the bloc as it prepares for its first African host, with South Africa set to assume the presidency in 2025. But what should be South Africa's vision for the G20 presidency? Joining me now is Professor Adikei Adibajo, who is a senior research fellow from the Center um, for Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria. Professor, very good morning to you. Thank you so much for making time for us. Before we speak about what is expected of South Africa or the expectations that there could be, what about the statement by the leaders that have come out of the G20 and that is currently taking place? What is it that we should be looking at? I think uh, what Brazil has done during its G20 presidency over the last year is to try to focus attention on sustainable development goals uh, and also reforming institutions of global governance like the UN Security Council, the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. And the big focus has also been on hunger uh, and tackling global hunger and social inclusion. I think South Africa will build on that mm -hmm. and take it forward. And I think the main things that South Africa is going to focus on is climate change and trying to get rich countries to provide the $100 billion dollars a year uh, for developing countries to be able to adjust to climate change. South Africa has also been urged to focus on trying to make the link between its own new development plan, the African Union's Agenda 2063, and the United Nations Pact for the Future, which was agreed in September by world leaders. And this, it's particularly important to note that the African Union joined the G20 in 2023, and South Africa is expected to coordinate very closely with the G20. And I think a final thing that South Africa will try to tackle is debt. African countries have $1.1 trillion in debt. Uh, they typically spend 45% of their revenues on servicing these unpayable debts. And countries like Ghana, Ethiopia, and Zambia have defaulted. So that's going to be also a major part of what South Africa will focus on in its 2025. And the theme of South Africa is fostering solidarity, equality, and sustainable development next year. Yeah. Uh, speaking about uh, climate change and the funding for climate change, it has been a major issue at the various multinational bodies as well, including um, the G, um, including um, the COP29, which, which is currently underway. One of the proposals that was made by Lula da Silva was that 2% tax on billionaires. And the reports that we are receiving that are coming out of Rio de Janeiro is that there is a pushback, specifically from the US as well as Germany as well. Do you think that that particular proposal is something that South Africa would be able to carry, uh, to carry on with? I think Germany, Spain and South Africa have actually supported South Africa in that proposal. But... Once the big elephant in the room, of course, is Donald Trump's election uh, this month. He will take over on the 20th of January. And if Donald Trump's first term is anything to go by, then global multilateralism is in big trouble. Because the last time Trump was in power, he pulled out of the World Health Organization in the middle of a global pandemic, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, he pulled the, U uh, the U.S. out of UNESCO, the UN Educational Scientific uh, Organization. And he also took a wrecking ball to the dispute mechanism of the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. So I do not think that, especially under a Trump presidency, where billionaires like Elon Musk have supported him so actively and he's just given him a job to cut government expenditure, I don't think you're going to see any action on that. And it can't happen anyway without the U.S. because it has the most billionaires along with China.
Yeah, and here's another aspect now that you've touched on the World Trade Organization as well, is um, the WTO, ahead of the G20 summit, um, has pointed out, looking at their review between October 2023 and 2024, that there has been 91 trade restrictive measures that have been implemented. And again, going back uh, to the Trump presidency, what would this then mean for the WTO and how to handle some of these um, restrictive measures if a Donald Trump was to, again, as he's promised during his elections as well, during um, his election campaign as well, uh, to impose tariffs? One thing I want to say is that the tariffs that Donald Trump imposed on China were not removed by Joe Biden. So the kind of anti-China tariffs uh, and trying to restrict Chinese trade is a bipartisan business in the U.S. where the Democrats and Republicans basically agree on it. But with Donald Trump basically threatening tariffs of over 50% against China and even 20% against its European allies. You'll remember in the first Trump presidency, there were tariffs on European steel, for example. Uh, I think we're in for a very rough ride. I don't think that the WTO's dispute resolution mechanism will be restored to functionality. And of course, countries will also retaliate against the US. The Chinese will retaliate against US agriculture and try to hurt its farmers. So you could have a really damaging and pernicious trade war that's going to hurt everybody in the end. Yeah, um, again, if you look at South Africa's uh, G20 presidency, it says that the focus and the theme there is going to be solidarity, inclusion and sustainability. And with the appointment of the, th uh, of the three um, organizations that are going to form part of the think tank, uh, the T20, they mentioned that strengthening the WTO is important. But how do you strengthen the WTO? when you have certain aspects that haven't been dealt with, including that um, a dispute resolution mechanism? I think strengthening the WTO is beyond the presidency of South Africa's powers. Strengthening the WTO depends basically on two main countries, the US and China, and then the European Union, which is the third strongest bloc within the WTO. So it's at that level that it's going to happen. I don't think South Africa during its year of the presidency is going to be able to do much. I'm not saying it shouldn't try to do it or, you know, push measures to try to make that happen. But I think that South Africa would be much better off focusing on many of the development debt, sustainable development priorities, reforming global governance institutions that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and, and again, when we look at back at what happened during COVID-19, it seemed as though that South Africa was able to make some sort of inroads, um, especially when it comes to the availability of, um, of those life-saving uh, um, drugs that were needed at, at, at the time. Uh, so don't you think that perhaps maybe South Africa will have some bit of a persuasive arm um, to deal with the strengthening of the WTO? You know, persuasion is one thing, but when you're dealing with a character as erratic and as nativist as a Donald Trump, as U.S. president, then all bets are off. And you can have a look at the kind of appointments that Donald Trump has made. You know, they're not diverse appointments. They're lily white, almost all of the uh, appointments he's made so far lack diversity, and many of them are quite right-wing ideologues that are pursuing a Make America Great Again uh, ideology. So I don't think persuasion is what uh, is, it's going to take to make Donald Trump do the right thing, but there's no reason not to try to mm. push on many of these fronts. I'm just trying to say that a year is not a very long time. It's going to go by very quickly. And South Africa has to pick its priorities, uh, 
where it feels yep. it's going to be able to make an impact. And I think that's on African development. Yeah. Then let's go to the African Union and its membership of the G20, what this means. And when we speak, for instance, about the conflict on, um, on the continent, of course, we've lost, we've missed that deadline of silencing the guns by, um, by 2020. That hasn't happened. Instead, what we've seen is an increase in conflict um, happening on the continent. But with the African Union being part of the G20, does that mean that a platform has been created for the African Union to put forward an argument that looks into the involvement of G20 members in some of the conflicts that we are seeing on the continent? Um. I mean, I happen to be very skeptical about membership by the African Union uh, on the G20, because unlike the European Union, which is more of a supranational organization, which negotiates on behalf of all 27 of its countries and has autonomy and real powers, the African Union does not have those kind of powers. And, you know, the European Union has a staff of 33,000 compared to a thousand or less for the African Union. And the African Union will be represented by whoever happens to be the chair at the time. Uh, it's not as effective uh, as, say, the European Union. So what I would like to see is more African countries represented on the G20s, countries like Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, which are the biggest economies after South Africa, and putting forward those ideas. But uh, I think there's no harm in the African Union putting forward ideas about resolving conflicts. It's just that, remember that the G20 was set up in 1999 to coordinate global economic governance after the Asian financial crisis of 97 to 98. So it's not really going to focus on conflicts, although the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East tend to spill over into discussions of the G20 and make consensus more difficult to reach. Yeah, and the reason that I raised this question about conflict on the continent is because on the one end we're speaking about the Africa continental free trade area and why it is important for, um, for the country, uh, I mean for the nations on the continent. But then there's also this conversation about logistics and how conflict has an impact on logistics. Absolutely. I mean, without uh, resolving those conflicts, you can't develop and you can't basically uh, promote or achieve regional and continental integration. So it's, it's, it's a very good point, an important point yep. you're making. My point is just that this will be done more effectively in institutions like SADC and the African Union and the United Nations rather than at the G20. Well, the very same United Nations Security Council that's not transforming. Just quickly, um, your, your take on um, the veto yesterday at the United Nations Security Council on, on Sudan, on the conflict in Sudan, that veto there by, by Russia. What's your take on that? Well, it, it's all part of the geopolitics that is happening based on the war in Ukraine. And obviously... The West has largely sanctioned and isolated Russia and is, has been arming Ukraine for the last two years. And uh, the US and Europeans just made the decision that Ukraine could actually use the weapons it's been supplied, the long range weapons inside Russia, which could have really dangerous uh, consequences. We'll wait to see what happens. But I think the Sudan vote is basically collateral damage and a proxy of those bigger conflicts. Yeah. Prof, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Professor um, Adibajo there from the University of uh, Pretoria speaking to us about uh, the G20, which concludes in uh, Brazil and, of course, South Africa taking over uh, the presidency of uh, the G20. And what will the G20 look like under a South African president?